and especially with the talk this evening being on the subject of non-self. We're going to pay special attention to that part of the mind that likes to get involved and do stuff and just notice how peaceful it can be to let go of that a little bit. When the self gets out of the way, we can deepen in peace. So, closing your eyes and just noticing that you're in a space which is your own, hopefully free of many of the thoughts, distractions, impressions of the day. Sometimes it's nice to keep returning to the same spot to meditate so that the mind has that association. But this is a time you can go inside. Free from perceptions of the world and concerns with the perceptions of others. No one's judging, measuring, assessing you. There's nothing to do or perform. So to help that perception, make sure that your body is really as comfortable as it could be. You may even wish to lean against a wall or use extra cushions. Maybe sit in a chair. Just see what your body really needs right now and respect that. And just mentally going through your body, superficially for now, just to check that your limbs are positioned in a way that is relaxing, loose, where nothing's pressing or tight. Sometimes it's only when we've closed our eyes that we can feel that we have a waistband or belt that's pressing into the skin. Or maybe we've brought those hunched up shoulders into the sit that we needed when we were, or we went into automatically when we were at the computer, but now we can lean back a bit and let some of that tension go. And if it helps to settle, just taking two or three slightly deeper breaths. Noticing the energizing effect of the in-breath and a sense of relaxation and letting go as the breath is released. Welcoming the whole of you, body, mind, moods, emotions and feelings to really arrive. To 
as though you were greeting a friend that you haven't seen for a very long time. Who's been too busy to gain your attention, your care. Now you have that time to care. So I'd like to start the meditation by inviting you to bring to mind something that you've done today or maybe in the last week or even month that you feel good about. Maybe a kind word to a friend or a parent. Perhaps standing up for what you believe is right. Maybe for caring for people in hospital, if you're a nurse or doctor. Or just a quality that you appreciate in yourself. Something you can really respect and value. And as you recollect that particular act or that quality, notice how that makes you feel. If you can sense some uplift in the heart. Maybe a sense of satisfaction that your life it's going more or less in the right direction. We're just tuning in to the beauty of kindness. And the gift of kindness to the world. You might sense a slight softening of the heart. And with this sense of appreciation, self-respect, we're going to start by becoming aware of the sensations in the tips of our toes. and allowing that kind awareness to spread at your own speed through the entire foot, either at the surface level of the skin or if it happens naturally deep inside Remaining open, curious, and friendly towards anything that arises.
as you move up the legs into the knees, the thighs. You might notice sensations that are a result perhaps of what you've been doing today. Maybe standing for long hours or putting strain or pressure on the knees. Recognizing that these sensations are just the product of conditions. And you have some capacity to influence the experience by the way that you're aware. See if you can notice how the body responds when it's met with kindly eyes. And as you move up into the torso, in your own time, also noticing any sensations there. For me, I can notice some sensations of nausea, a little bit of bloating in the stomach area. <clears throat> and I can see that tendency to contract, for the mind to want to pull back. So I just see if I can soften around the edges of those sensations, giving them space, permission to just be. looking upon them the way a mother would look upon a child who's perhaps bruised their knee. And I can feel those sensations softening. The mind expanding and becoming softer, more receptive, less reactive to these changing sensations. I have nothing to do with me. Just arising due to causes. And passing away when those causes cease. And as you continue your exploration through the torso, see if you can notice all those places that you may 
often neglect, such as the sides of the ribs, the armpits. Perhaps places in the spine. And see if you can notice your relationship with the experiences of pleasant, neutral or unpleasant experiences, both in the body and in the mind. What happens when you control, resist, or cling to experience? And how peaceful is it when that can be relaxed? When the sense of self can just settle back into the mode of a passive observer, recognizing that whatever arises is just a product of conditions without substance, without essence, or any core And the awareness, along with kindness, keeps spreading right up into the shoulders, and through the arms to the hands. Receiving all these experiences.
into the neck. To the top of the spinal cord, the throat. The whole area of the face and head in your own time. face and the head is often where we identify ourselves the most. Just see if you can notice the difference between imagining the way your face looks, the expressions, the glint in your eye, that which you recognize as me. And the bare sense of a felt experience. Maybe areas with clear sensations. Other areas that are more vague. Is there anything really solid, even in the head? So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. How does your body feel now? Can you recognize the sense of relaxation, peace and ease? Compared to when you began? And if so, what is the cause? Was it something you made happen? Or did that settling, relaxation and calm arise when you just step back? And got out of the way.
suspending judgments and evaluations, just opening to the nature of arising and passing away. So before I ring the bell, I just invite you to smile into your body. Smile into your mind. And express a sense of gratitude and appreciation for your practice. Recognizing this too as one beautiful, kind and wise gift that you've offered to yourself and to the world. Very good. Can anyone hear my neighbors? Yeah. <laughs> Some of you can. I don't know, I've never been here, you see, at this time of the year, but it's like the time that the neighbors like to have parties in the garden. And all our gardens are kind of back to back. I've got just a little courtyard, but uh, all the others, sort of, because it's rows of terraces, so they're all sort of back to back, so we share. <laughs> we share each other's music, unfortunately, which, uh, well, I don't have much music except for the chanting, but they share their pop music and whatever else they play. <laughs> so, tonight I have had feedback from everybody or from a lot of people that they wouldn't mind taking things a bit deeper and looking at the doctrine of non-self, as it's called in the English translation. And so this is a deep teaching, but it's also a very profound and powerful teaching, which has a, an effect on our practice. It can be experienced in practice and lead to a, a deeper sense of letting go. So I used to think, I guess, that the experience or the insight into non-self was a kind of breakthrough moment, you know, that signified the moment of stream entry. And I didn't really understand how it could work as a practice. So my focus was more on impermanence and watching things arise and pass away. But as I said yesterday in my little life uh, depiction, <laughs> one particular storyline to my life that I could give, um, there was still this sense of somebody there watching this whole thing, even though I knew that consciousness too was not a self. But uh, I think it can be very helpful in this case to really go into the suttas and hear the Buddha's words on what it really means and how it can be applied, um, even in our meditation, as a way of looking, as a way of perceiving what's going on. Because it is the non-self and the insight into that that makes one a stream winner. And this is the breakthrough that we need to make. So my teacher, Ajahn Brahm, always says that he thinks it's easier to make that breakthrough through non-self than through something like impermanence. Maybe because it's easy to see impermanence to a certain depth, but then one tends to get stuck without the teaching of non-self. Because real impermanence means that things actually cease, things actually disappear. It's not only that they're arising and vanishing, they're actually ceasing entirely. So, 
I wanted to talk uh, from the Buddhist suttas because I think it's better than speaking from my own limited experience into this, um, the depth of the insight. And also because the Buddha phrases things and puts things so beautifully and succinctly in a way that can really speak to our heart. So I'm going to look at the Anattalakana Sutta, which is the second discourse that the Buddha gave after his enlightenment. And it's the first discourse where there became other arahats, other fully enlightened people in the world. So in his first discourse, the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, he focused very much on the Four Noble Truths, yeah? the nature of suffering, the cause for suffering to arise, the path leading to the end of suffering and the cause for suffering to cease. I did those last two in reverse order, just by accident more than anything. But um, it was basically like a prescription, like a doctor's prescription. So he diagnosed the problem that was suffering. He diagnosed the cause. Yeah, the cause of suffering is craving, wanting, thirst, tanha in Pali. And then the solution of that to that suffering were four different types of letting go, giving up, contentment if you wish. Yeah, the opposite of holding on, but actually putting things down. And then the path to the end of suffering, which is the eightfold path. Yeah, not just mindfulness and not just samadhi nor just right view, but the whole Eightfold Path, which includes a substantial amount of teaching on virtue and sila and how to apply that in our life. And then as a result of that discourse, one of his five friends was enlightened, or at least to the first stage of stream entry, and that was, he was called Anya Kandanya, which literally means like the first. Um, Kandanya was his name. And his insight was that basically whatever arises, whatever has the nature to arise, has the nature to cease. Yeah. Yam kinchi samudaya dhammam, sabbantan niroda dhammanti. Whatever has the nature to arise, that's whatever we can see, feel, hear, smell, taste, touch, perceive, yeah, be conscious of, all of that has the nature to cease. And he saw that through experience. So whether he actually saw a cessation there or he saw that things can cease, I'm not very clear because I haven't experienced that myself. But certainly at that point, he was ready to take a deeper step. And all of the other five companions that were there in that first discourse were there for the second discourse called the Anattalakana Sutta. And this is where the Buddha took it deeper by explaining what non-self really means. So obviously the insight into impermanence is very much connected to that because if something ceases, it can't really be deserving of the name of a soul or a self. You know, a soul or a self is something which has some kind of inherent reality, some kind of permanence, like a permanent essence or something that flows through everything else, right? So some people feel that, you know, the senses, the six senses, actually mind is included in one of these senses, are the senses of sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and mind, right? And some people feel that mind is always there, you know, behind these other five senses, so to speak. But in fact, the Buddha didn't say that. He didn't give any kind of special hierarchy to any one of these senses. He said that they were all arising and vanishing constantly within, you know, a microsecond. They arise and they cease. Yeah. So we won't go into that too much more right now because that involves me going straight into the suttas. Um, but I wanted to talk about non-self and some of the um, some of the misunderstandings around it, because there's a common kind of discussion going on in Buddhist circles about um, is the idea of everything ceasing the same as annihilation, right? And I just want to make this very clear from the outset that there's a huge difference between something that's inherently existing being annihilated and something which was never really there in the way that we take it to be there, ceasing, right? This is a huge difference. So it's not so much that somebody who was existing is then ceasing. There was actually, we misapprehended what is actually a dependently originated process as a self we took something that is not a self to be a self and the buddha says this very nicely um in this is the kachana gotha sutta in the nidana samyutta so this is samyutta nikaya 12 15. so this uh, wanderer venerable kachana gotha came to the buddha 
and was talking about the origin of the world and whether things really exist or don't exist. So let me take out the key bits. So the Buddha says, this world for the most part depends on a duality, upon the notion of existence and the notion of non-existence. But for one who sees the origin of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no notion of non-existence in regard to the world. And for one who sees cessation of the world as it really is with correct wisdom, there's no notion of existence in regard to the world. Then he says, all exists. This is one extreme. All does not exist. This is a second extreme. Without veering towards either of these extremes, the Tathagata, which means the Buddha, teaches the Dhamma by the middle. With delusion as a condition, volitional formations come to be. With volitional formations as a condition, consciousness comes to be. And from consciousness, is it Vijnana Pachaya, Nama Rupa, name and form come to be, or mind and mental objects, if you like. And from mind and mental objects, the sixth sense consciousness has come to be. From those sense consciousnesses and their respective sense doors, and the consciousness that arises at each sense door, contact produces feeling. Feeling comes to be. And with feeling there, we talked about this last week, with Vedana present, tanha, craving, clinging, wanting comes to be. Yeah, and with wanting, of course, grasping, which is often translated as attachment, from attachment, birth or renewed existence, and from existence, old age, suffering, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And at the same time, he's talking about the reverse process of dependent origination. So with the abandoning of ignorance, with the um, cessation of delusion, all those other subsequent factors cease because you pull the rug out under everything and he says such is the cessation of this whole mass of suffering so here he's saying that there's not nothing nor is the something but what there is is a process of dependent arising yeah one thing conditions the next and so this whole mass of suffering arises based on delusion and this is very important because this shows us a little bit where we can start to break the chain. And as we discussed last week, one possibility is to start to work at the level of sensation and break that um, condition tendency to react to things with, with craving, either craving for or craving to get rid of. But another place, and perhaps an even deeper place, to work on weakening that whole chain is at delusion itself. And for this, we need to actually start to overcome the five hindrances, which are nutriments for delusion. Yeah. So the Buddha didn't say delusion has a first cause, but he did say there are things which nourish delusion, and they're the five hindrances. So this is why the practice of samadhi is so important, because it's only through really deep samadhi that we can really abandon those hindrances, at least for a time, and have a chance to th see things as they really are. So having talked about that and about this... Um, ongoing discussion between existence and non-existence, I want to get into the Anattalakana Sutta and talk about how the Buddha describes uh, non-self. So last week, as I mentioned, we went into the Vedana, which is one of what the Buddha calls the five components of existence. Yeah? And these five components or aggregates are supposed to describe the entire world of mind and matter. Right? So the world in this context means the world as we experience it, our own world of experience. So there is the body, there is feeling, there's perception, mental volitions or mental reactions, reactivity, if you like. Sometimes Ajahn Brahm and Ajahn Brahmali call this will, or for shorthand, they call it the doer. So it's that part of the mind that does, that reacts, that's always involved, producing, fabricating, and getting, you know, sticking its fingers in all the time. I'm sure we all know very much about that doer and how it interrupts the process of peace. <laughs> and then uh, the last one is the consciousness. And as I said, this consciousness relates to all of the six senses. So it's not only mind consciousness, it's also eye, ear, nose, taste and body consciousness. Yeah. 
So here we go. This is uh, from the Kanda Samyutta, number uh, Samyutta Nikaya 22, and the characteristic of non-self is number 59. You'll notice here that it's called non-self and not not-self. And I think this is another important point to make at the beginning, because the Buddha didn't say there was a true self. He's not saying that these things are not self, but there's another self, a real self that you can find somewhere else. There is no reference to anything that he would describe as a self anywhere in the suttas. So the idea of not self, I feel, can be misleading because it can give the idea that, okay, well, this is not self, but perhaps there's something that is self. And that can lead to the, the line of inquiry, who am I? Whereas if you say non-self, and you recognize that the Buddha's going through the whole of possible existence, anything you can call a component of existence, and saying that none of this is a self. Then the question becomes, what do I take to be a self? Do you see the difference? So we're not looking for some kind of self that we haven't yet figured out what it is. We're actually looking to eliminate or to, let's say, um, overcome delusion wrong ways of taking things which are not a self to be a self yeah so we're looking at all those areas where a self a sense of self can dwell and the first one of course is the body so the buddha says bhikkhus and this is addressed to monks but it could equally be addressed to bhikkhunis some people say that that includes bhikkhunis because bhikkhus were the senior members of the sangha so the buddha always addressed the senior most members form is non-self if form were self this form would not lead to affliction and it would po be possible to have it of form let my form be thus let my form not be thus but because form is non-self form leads to affliction and it is not possible to have it of form let my form be thus let my form not be thus yeah so this is pretty obvious in a sense, and yet there's a huge industry in plastic surgery and all kinds of strange things to try to change our body shapes because we don't like the way they are. And we're so identified with them that we feel that our happiness lies in, you know, making them just so. But it's obviously a, a complete uh, sort of something without really an end in sight. I mean, look at Michael Jackson, for example, doing so much plastic surgery and I don't really know what was underlying that, whether there's some sort of sense of self-hatred or I really don't know. But, you know, you can never find satisfaction and happiness that way. Right? When we're young, we tend to think, oh, this body it does whatever I want. You know, it's not true that I can't control it. I can go to the gym. I can, you know, eat really well and I can be fit. My body will take me where I want to go. And I remember having that conceit myself. You don't really think of it as a sense of conceit when you're younger, but it is actually what the Buddha pointed to as the conceit of health, the conceit of youth. And it wasn't until I got really sick in Burma that I realized, gosh, my body won't do what I ask anymore. I want the body to go downstairs and to walk down the street and, you know, maybe to get some arms food. And I just can't, I can't get there. At that time, I was actually on steroid medication for all this inflammation. And I think the doctors in Thailand gave me a hugely massive dose, which was far too much for my own body, um, what do you call it, like weight, because it's supposed to be by body weight. And they gave me like the maximum dose that's possible. So I'd literally get to the bottom of some stairs and, and have to like stop because the adrenaline would be just going crazy and, you know, or it would crash completely. And I wouldn't be able to get back upstairs. I'd have to sit there and wait. And it was the first time I realized, gosh, I can't just sort of expect my body to follow my mind in the same way that I used to. Yeah. So, I mean, the Buddha's not saying there's no pleasure to be found in these things. You know, there's no gratification in a healthy body, but he is saying it doesn't last. I read a little um, article today about foxes. And foxes, apparently, in England, which, uh, you know, there are a lot of foxes and a lot of urban foxes. The urban foxes are starting to evolve differently. Their snouts are getting shorter and wider than the countryside foxes. And they're thinking that this might be because it's easier to forage for food that way. And also their brains are getting smaller, which are more like kind of pet dogs. I didn't realize that country dogs have bigger brains than pet dogs, but 
I had to laugh because I thought maybe that's to do with being too close to us human beings. Their brains are shrinking. <laughs> but uh, it's so interesting to see that, you know, because again, how can you say then even that a, a body and the way that a body is evolved is a self, it's constantly changing. It's a product of conditions. It's a product of its environment and it's formed and keeps evolving due to that environment that it finds itself in. Yeah. I mean, when you think about what's going on currently with all the racism, well, being exposed, but moreover, all the anti-racist protests, and you really kind of look at what this is about, it's just about melanin. I mean, at the bottom line, it, you know, the only difference between us is the amount of melanin in our bodies. I mean, how incredibly crazy is that? You know, people born in hotter countries have more melanin. People born in cooler countries have less because we need the vitamin D and we need to let the sunshine in, <laughs> right? I mean, I always used to joke in India about my skin being pretty hopeless because I just burn like anything. And actually, since then, I actually got a melanoma. So, you know, I would probably prefer to have darker skin. I think it not only looks nicer, <laughs> maybe I'm not allowed to say that, but, but it's actually, you know, more um, adapted to warmer climates, right? So when you really look at this, when you look at what form is and you see that it's arisen entirely dependent on the conditions or the environments that it was you know, made for, how does it make sense to hate? How can you hate conditions? Is it possible to hate conditions? <laughs> you know, we don't recognize that everything we're seeing is a process, it's in a process. Yeah, it's not even the final product. And then we allow hatred to arise based on tiny little things that, tiny little differences that we ascribe, the most superficial things. Most often I think it's fear, fear of the unknown. But also that we're looking for something to hate. Anyway, getting on to the next part about feelings, he says the same thing. So because feelings are non-self, for if because feelings were self, then feelings would not lead to affliction. And it would be possible to have a feelings, let my form be, sorry, let my feelings be thus, let my feelings not be thus. But because feelings are non-self, they lead to affliction. And it is not possible to have it of feelings, let my feelings be thus, let my feelings not be thus. Yeah. How many of you wanted to like get blissed out in the meditation? <laughs> <laughs> hopefully you're wiser than that but you know we really can't do this I, I thought I was getting healthy because uh, you know some of the bacteria had started to um, reduce a little bit in my stomach but now I'm on this different medication and I'm getting very unpleasant feelings throughout my body and and mind actually you know they're sort of going into my head like toxic headaches and making me very very tired actually uh went to bed at about half past one this afternoon and just lay down to have a little rest because I couldn't think. And at half past three, I kind of came around like, wow, where was I? Because of this feelings in the body, you know, and the way the body's uh, responding to the medication again, completely out of my control. So feelings never give you enough pleasure. We can't rely on them. And again, the Buddha said there is a gratification there, obviously. But he likened that gratification to a dog that's looking for a bone, looking for a bone with meat. But all the dog finds is a bone smeared with blood. Yeah? And this is similar to looking for feelings to satisfy us. You know, sometimes they have a sense of, oh, this is something, this is something pleasant. Maybe this can last. Maybe this means my life's going well or my relationships are going well. But it's so insubstantial if it's not based on something deeper like ethics and a real sense of unconditional love, it's very unsubstantial. Yeah. So the Buddha likened sensual desire to this blood smeared bone that can never satisfy. And that probably leaves you a lot more frustrated than you were in the first place. Right. The other difficulty with sensual pleasures and sensual feelings is that um, we become dependent on them after a while. Yeah especially if we go to them as a kind of escape or a distraction. Everybody knows how it feels to be a bit lonely and to kind of search in the fridge for anything to eat, right? <laughs> the kind of things that you would have eaten early in the day and that didn't look attractive suddenly look really attractive or you kind of concoct some kind of special recipe to get some kind of sensual hit. 
<laughs> yeah. Or, or we're just addicted to things like coffee for our energy source. So these things don't really work. And it's really interesting with feelings because the Buddha did talk about other kinds of feelings which are more wholesome and more unworldly. And they're things like gratitude, joy, inspiration. And of course, some of the feelings that come from having a peaceful mind and developing a peaceful heart in meditation. Things like piti and sukha, yeah, the rapture that can arise. This is already moving towards an, a wholesome kind of happiness. But even then we can react with craving and kind of spoil the whole process and make it into something much coarser again. So feelings can't be relied on. Yeah. And also we can't even rely on unpleasant experiences sometimes. I mean, I've had experiences in my meditation where um, I, yeah, there was one time in Belgium many, many years ago where I had an asthma attack because there was uh, a lot of dust in the place. And uh, I had my inhaler there, but I didn't want to take it. I wanted to see if I could use my meditation to overcome this kind of really chronic tightening in the chest and a sense of really not being able to breathe. And I stayed awake for about three or four hours working with this. And I thought I was being kind of calm and being aware and being open to the sensations. So I was kind of going through my body and scanning my body and staying cool, staying calm, making sure I was breathing as, you know, not panicking over the tightness in my chest. But it took about three hours to realize that I was almost omitting the part that was most constricted and most difficult to be with. And as soon as I realized that and I could soften my awareness around that chest, and actually allow myself to breathe out because asthma surprisingly is not a problem with breathing in it's a problem with being able to expel the carbon dioxide to be able to take another breath in and as soon as i went to that area in the chest it was almost like in an instant everything cleared and it was almost as though oxygen felt like it was just coursing through my blood and through my body as if all that constriction had passed and it was really one of those kind of lightning moments where you just suddenly get the attitude right and you suddenly sort of let go of that resistance. It's that letting go again, that really embracing and being content to be with this tight chest, to be with this breath that won't come in or out and to let go. And at that moment, the whole thing changed. Ajahn Ram tells a story actually very rarely, but because he likes to talk about bliss. But there is a story of one of his disciples who has very bad migraine headaches and, um, and they were so incredibly intense that he couldn't do anything. You know, he'd be just in a dark room for like days on end, unable to bear this pain. But he started to learn to meditate and started to learn to really accept this pain, right? Because letting go doesn't mean bypassing, it means actually learning to fully embrace, to allow it to be. Right? So it's letting go of the reaction, it's letting go of the wanting to push it away. This is the letting go. And he managed to learn how to let go to the extent that he could get into really deep jhanas. Like these are really, really proper jhanas that Ajahn Brahm would actually classify that way. Because many people say they have jhanas, but if you go to Ajahn Brahm with an experience, most of the time he won't give any kind of confirmation because he's really looking for, you know, the stage where all the other senses have vanished and only the mind is left. So, and this man used to get into these very, very deep experiences. But then apparently later on, he overcame those headaches and then he found it difficult. He actually found it difficult because that pain at some point had become a way for him to really learn the art of letting go. You can see why Ajahn Brown doesn't talk about that because he doesn't want to encourage us to go through pain or to kind of suffer unnecessarily in any way. But I think it's incredibly powerful just to realize that when you are in a corner, this practice can really work. And it's, you know, that letting go comes from understanding that it's not self, right? Because it's when we take something to be me, to be mine, it becomes my problem. It becomes, I don't want this. I don't want this headache. This headache is killing me. But when we can see, oh, this terrible pain has arisen, can I just let go? allow it to be there, get out of the way. Suddenly in an instant it vanished for this particular person, which I found really interesting. So the Buddha continues and goes into perception, the next of the five khandhas, and he says, uh, bhikkhus, perception is non-self. For if bhikkhus, perception or self, 
this perception would not lead to affliction and it would be possible to have of perception. May my perception be thus. May my perception, sorry, let my perception not be thus. But because perception is non-self, it leads to affliction and it is not possible to have of perception. Let my perception be thus. Let my perception not be thus. So again, this is pointing to the fact that perceptions are conditioned. We see things a certain way because we've been taught to see it that way. You know, my political views, my sort of ethics, as much as I'd like to take credit for them, because obviously we all think our ethics are the best and are correct, right? Nobody thinks they have wrong view or wrong ethics. <laughs> um, I'd love to take credit, but I must give credit to my parents who raised me a certain way. You know, to the newspapers maybe that they read at the expense of other newspapers, which I'm very glad they didn't. But maybe they have to take the credit from theirs. Who knows? And what is passed down through genes? What is passed down through upbringing and the people we've been around? So the way we look at the world, the way we perceive ourselves and others, is not reliable. It's impermanent. It keeps changing. And so how can we say that that's a self? You know, often we judge ourselves. I judge myself, my intelligence, by the way I can perceive. And to a certain extent, there's a truth in that. You know, perception is malleable. It can change and it can be molded into positive directions, right? Some perceptions are more conducive to overcoming the hindrance perceptions and the buddha gives a big long list of perceptions in the giri mananda sutta i think it's in the anguttara tens and he talks about different ways we can perceive things through the lens of impermanence through the lens of non-self through looking at the um ugly nature of things or through looking at the beautiful nature you know you could add many perceptions through the eyes of loving kindness through the eyes of compassion so all of these are different perceptions we can adopt, but none of them really belong to us and none of them last forever. So we can move our perceptions in a way that's helpful and conducive to the practice. But ultimately, it's only when we've had these experiences of deep samadhi with the hindrances in abeyance really overcome that we have a chance to see things with fresh eyes, with fresh perception. And that is why we can see into things like non-self at that time because we simply can't do that without clearing our habitual ways of looking, you know, getting those out of the way. As long as we experience the hindrances, there's like a veil or a curtain in front of our eyes. You could also say it's like looking through a windscreen that's kind of mucky. You know, you think you see a tree or you think you see a bush, but you're not really sure. Or you see something on the road and it looks like a snake, but it's actually a rope because the windscreen's messy. Just letting someone in who might have dropped out. So perception really can't be trusted and for me that is such a big relief. In the past I used to be quite worried about what people thought of me, you know, like am I pleasing people? Am I, is what I'm saying like making sense? How am I going to turn up in public? This is a terrible thing to have to do. <laughs> and actually with this project it's been great because it's really challenged those things. And even before then, I mean even just asking questions say at another talk, I was asking questions at one of Ajahn Brahm's talks once and I went overboard and asked too many questions. And at the end I felt really mortified because I thought, my goodness, I've taken up all the time and I've been one of those really annoying people who just won't let anyone else have a chance. So I started asking, I, I apologize first of all to Ajahn Brahm. And he just said, oh no, you're just interested. You know, that's his perception, non-fault finding in any way. Always looking at the, the beautiful motivation for whatever you do. And then I spoke to someone else and they said, yes, well, it's good that you know it. And I was like, oh, OK. <laughs> and then I got kind of curious and I thought, well, I better apologize to a few more people because maybe people really were upset. And everyone I spoke to had a totally different interpretation of that situation. Some didn't even notice that I asked a lot of questions. Some said that the questions were great and they were really inspired. Others said, yeah, yeah, I like it when people ask questions. You know, it doesn't bother me. And it just really pulled the rug out of this kind of believing in what people think. And then I thought, if all these different people have a different perception, and even their perceptions are not reliable, imagine how many different perceptions they might have on different days. I mean, I know that on some days, 
I can see the best in a person. On other days, all the things that irritate me about them arise. So my perception of another person is constantly changing. So how on earth are we going to manage the entire universe's worth of perceptions of ourselves? <laughs> it's just impossible and a huge headache. So at the moment, I'm feeling like I don't like to be criticised. I won't say I like it, but I'm much, much less sensitive than I used to be. And one of the reasons is because I know I'm doing my best. I'm in, aligned with my best intentions, you know, and I try to put my values into practice as far as I can, given the conditions, right? Given the input from my teachers and the particular conditions I find myself in, I'm doing my best. So where's the point in worrying about conditions, uh, about criticism, really? There's a little joke that Ajahn Brown sometimes says, and I love this. He says, um, for the first 30 or 40 years of your life, you're worrying about what people think of you. Then for the next sort of 20 or 30 years to about 60 or 70, you think, nah, I don't really care that much what people think of me. And then for the last years of your life, sort of 70, 60 plus, sorry, you're not going to die, anyone who's over 60. But, you know, it depends how wise you are. If you're really wise, you figure it out earlier on. Then you figure out, oh, actually, no one was thinking about me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that nice because we all think that we're like the center of everybody's world and we're really not <laughs> we might be the center of our own world a little bit but even that is quite painful when it becomes the case yeah so and then the next one i know that this is probably going to go on longer than half an hour but i would like to try and at least skim through the other candles. The next one is about um, what is translated here by Bhikkhu Bodhi as volitional formations, and that is translated from the word Sankara. As I said, it literally means a kind of um, mental reactivity or reaction. Um, and Ajahn Brahmali and Ajahn Ram, through their scholastic research, have figured out that it basically means will, and that will is one of the biggest components of that particular kanda. So it's the sense of having to do. And this is also where karma comes in, like just thinking about something, just feeling feelings in the body, even having certain perceptions is not necessarily creating karma. It's not necessarily having an impact and an effect on others. To some degree it will, but the sankara is more of like a reaction that actually um, causes us to either suffer or to hopefully not suffer too much. Um, and it leads to action, it leads to um, creating karma in the world. So it's this reactive part of mind, the mind that we need to learn to um, soften and pacify. And also Ajahn Brahm's very big on sort of trying to um, let the process of meditation happen without a sense of doing it, yeah? So he always says that the more we do, the less peace is possible. Yeah. So we have to get ourselves out of the way. Okay. I'm just checking that everyone can hear me because Shirley says she's got a problem. Can everyone, is everyone else okay with the sound? Yeah, that's cool. All right. So yeah, so this Sankara is um, really, really important in the practice, I would say. And there's a very big difference with starting out your practice by thinking, right, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to kind of do this properly. Come on, mind, watch the breath. And approaching it from a different perspective. Like today, I tried to start us off by just bringing to mind some of the beautiful things, even little kind acts that we may have performed in the last week or so, or kind words we may have said to another, just to get a sense of what is the effect of that on you? What is the effect? So you're starting to bring up certain perceptions, certain qualities in the mind that can be like a kind of springboard for the practice. So you're starting off from a place of, um, of softening, a place of slight uplift and, and a little bit of a sense of joy in the mind. And from there, we can use this kind of very gentle body sweep where again, we're kind of getting out of the way. The only part of us that's really doing anything is that part which is just scanning gently through the body. But we go gently and we go with a lot of kindness. So again, we're not trying to manipulate our experience or say, oh, I don't want to feel this way, you know. 
we're trying to see how when we let go and when we're able to open to our experience as it arises things actually start to unfold on their own and from there i like to just sometimes invite the breath to come in most often i don't even think about the breath but it just comes along in its own time and this can start a different kind of process which is not a process of doing but a process of what um, Ajahn Brahmali calls transcendental dependent origination. Sometimes he calls it dependent liberation. And it's almost the opposite of the dependent arising, the process leading to suffering. The transcendental liberation is actually going um, from suffering into confidence in the teachings. Yeah? So from suffering, we can actually turn it around. We come in contact with the teachings of the Buddha we hear that there's a cause to suffering and we can start to put into place the um, solution, yeah? The antidote to that suffering, that letting go. And this gives us an enormous amount of confidence and joy that this is really possible for us. You know, there's a way out. We have some kind of ability to, um, to modify the effects of suffering by the way we're aware, by the way that we meet that suffering when it arises and from there there's a different process that starts to happen that goes through this pt in the mind this rapture and then that rapture starts to settle after some time all on its own and turn into tranquility and then turn into what's called sukha which is a kind of contented happiness and from there into states of deep calm and this happens all as a result of actually taking a back seat, like a back seat passenger. I think yesterday I said I was a back seat driver, but actually that's wrong. It's not a back seat driver, it's a back seat passenger. So you're just looking out the window and you're seeing these different emotions, these different feelings passing by, and you're just resting with them, opening to them and trusting this process to unfold. So this is a very, very different process from coming into the meditation with a sense of self, wanting to fix things up, even wanting to improve ourself. Yeah? Many of us come to the practice because we feel somehow deficient or lacking in some way. Yeah? We want to improve ourselves and that can be well motivated, but it's much more powerful to start realizing that actually it's our, our self can't improve ourself. Ourself and the trying to change is actually part of the problem. <laughs> yeah, I think, was it Ajahn Chah said, it's like trying to eat your own head. He always has these really great, um, <laughs> great phrases. Um, so, so this sankara in meditation is really not a helpful thing. And the Buddha says in the suttas time and again, you know, he talks about the importance of conditioning, the importance of such things like spiritual friendship. Yeah. Because it's the spiritual friendship, it's learning from good teachers or learning from the Buddha himself that programs our mind in a different direction. Yeah. I mean, how many of us would actually be here now if we hadn't come in contact with a Buddhist teacher or a Dhamma book? It's basically not possible, right? And that's why one of the first factors for stream entry is the word of another, paritagosa. It means the word of another. And after the word of another, the work of the mind that goes to the source, yoni so malisikara, the work of the mind that investigates how things arise and how things cease, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's all around this conditionality, time and again we come back to it. And the last one, just to go through it quickly, is about consciousness. And uh, we've only done about a third of the sutta, even if I go through consciousness now. So we might have to do the second part next week. Um, but the Buddha says about consciousness, that consciousness, and let me just pause there because Ajahn Brahm actually calls it consciousnesses. As I said, there are six. Consciousnesses are non-self. For if consciousnesses were self, consciousnesses would not lead to affliction. And it would be possible to have it of consciousnesses. Let my consciousnesses be thus. Let my consciousness not be thus. But because consciousnesses are non-self, they lead to affliction. And it's not possible to have of them. Let them be thus. Let them not be thus. Yeah. So again, we can't even control what we're conscious of. 
this is really almost impossible as soon as the eye meets a, a sight sight consciousness comes on because of that contact there's a feeling we can't control that i mean we can close our eyes for a bit but basically you're still going to be aware of something you're still going to be aware of the mind the thoughts in the mind so consciousness too is not a self and i think this is really important to at least get a theoretical theoretical understanding of because as i said in the beginning many people feel that it's pretty obvious that they're not their body or that at least that their body changes and leads to suffering but they do feel that there's something in there that is lasting and that's almost beyond those the, the law of cause and effect but as i said there was no hierarchy in these six sense consciousnesses or in the five khandas right different ways where consciousness is included all of them are told to be basically due to causes and they cease due to causes yeah they cease when those causes are removed and uh, just to bring that point home again about things ending and the fact that this whole path is leading towards a ceasing there's a lovely sutta called the Agavachigata sutta which is Majjhimanikaya number 72 and there's another wanderer here called Vacha and he also has this confusion about whether um, after liberation, the Buddha appears or does not reappear. So again, it's a little bit like, does he exist or does he not exist? And this is the Buddha's answer. He says, what do you think, Vacha? Suppose a fire were burning before you. Would you know that this fire is burning before me? Yes, Master Gautama. If someone were to ask you, Vacha, what does this fire burning before you depend on, burn independence on? Being asked thus, what would you answer? Being asked thus, Master Gautama, I would answer, this fire burns independence on fuel of grass and sticks. So then the Buddha says, if that fire before you were to be extinguished, would you know that this fire before me has been extinguished? I would, Master Gautama. If someone were to ask you, Vacha, when that fire before you was extinguished, to what direction did it go? Did it go to the east, to the west, to the north, or to the south? Being asked thus, what would you answer? That does not apply, Master Gautama. The fire burned up in dependence on fuel of grass and sticks. When that is used up, if it does not get any more fuel, being without fuel, it is reckoned to be extinguished. So that's a really beautiful simile, and that's where Ajahn Brown gets his slightly cheeky little joke about the flames going to a heaven of flames. <laughs> he said it's not that Nibbana is like a heaven where all the little flames go, it's just the ceasing of the flame. And that means it's the ceasing of feelings and perceptions and everything that can be known. But it's not a scary path. As I said, you know, if we're on this path with the right attitude and if we can learn to let go of that doing part of the mind earlier on in the meditation, then the path is just one of increasing happiness and bliss. You know, and we start to see through practice that the more we're able to let go, the more this deeper sense of contentment and peace can actually arise. It's almost as though we have to clear something away for something much more profound to emerge. And that something is this kind of constant craving and grasping and sense of self that wants to be involved, that wants to stick its fingers in and mess things up. <laughs> I've experienced that so many times in my meditation, you know, as the samadhi is starting to deepen and things are happening because I'm letting go. And then this little part of me wants to see, oh, 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 what next? Ooh. And it's not even a verbal thought at this point. It's just a little movement of the mind that still wants to be involved. And at that point, you can sometimes feel the process recede a little bit, and then you can let go again into it. So this involves trust, but it's also a path of increasing happiness and bliss. And the Buddha said that there are not only worldly feelings and unworldly feelings, but he said there's also a feeling that he describes as more unworldly than unworldly. <laughs> Sounds very cryptic and Zen-like, but basically that is a description of Nibbana. In the um, Bahuvedaniya Sutta, which I'm not sure I've got the reference for, 
um, the Buddha actually says that the end of perception and feeling is the highest happiness. And in another sutta, his chief disciple Sariputta says, well, how can somebody asks his chief disciple, how can it be the highest happiness when there's no perception and there's no feeling? And Sariputta gives this wonderful answer. He says, it's precisely because of the absence of perception and feeling that it is the highest happiness. So I can't explain that to you. The Buddha can't even explain it to us really, but I think it's beautiful to hear these teachings and to just get that sense that there's something beyond these five khandhas, there's something that is not a sense of self, and that by giving up that sense of self, sorry, not that there is something that's not a sense of self, but that by giving up this identification with the process and, you know, by understanding that what we take to be a self is not really a self, it's not really worth holding on to, it's not worth clinging to. We can gradually let it go and open the way to the highest happiness of Nibbana. Mm -hmm. So, this is not an easy topic or, uh, <laughs> to talk about because it's so enormous, but I hope that at least I've talked a little bit about the first part of that sutta and um, I would invite any questions at this point because there's a lot more that could be said and um, if there's interest we can continue a bit next week. <laughs>